Psalm 128. This is kind of part two and probably the last we'll do here on the topic of the family. Um, Last week I introduced that and I said I've been studying a lot and thinking through just different things on the family. Part of that was preparation for going up to Illinois and a message I was going to uh, do there or two messages that had to do with the family. So I was kind of just getting my, my mind thinking and I wanted to do part two. So last week, uh, part one was pretty much just talking about the family unit, like how we work together as a family, why it's important to uh, uh, to, to have each other and how two are better than one and, and, and all this. And actually, I was able to use that concept in Illinois. Um, and I talked about the course we had just got done doing the potluck 50 the day before, which is an endurance event. Um, some guys did 50 miles on bike or some did 50. Uh, Brother Austin did 50 on foot. I just did about 30 or actually 28 on foot. Uh, I was kind of going more for, for time, just eight hours. Uh, a couple others hiked but didn't go the whole, you know, the whole distance as either. And so it was just an opportunity to go out there and challenge ourselves. You know, it's not endurance if there's not something that you have to endure, like some, some little amount of suffering or something like that. So I used that su- that Sunday morning as an illustration of just the Christian life and the, the suffering that, that comes along with the Christian life. I mean, that doesn't sound like a glorious thing that everybody looks forward to, but it's true. And actually, uh, some great things that we get in life, you know, come with suffering. And from the curse, the fall of man, uh, there was obviously some extra uh, uh, difficulty in labor and everything. But really, even in creation, there was going to be some effort involved, tilling the land and and taking care of the garden there. It's going to be some, probably a little bit of suffering, just not as bad as after the fall. And God just seemed, it seemed like God made us to go through suffering. And so the point that I brought up in a... Uh, by using a couple of different illustrations and everything. But a point that I brought up is that it's a little bit easier. You know, our suffering is a little bit easier when we have a family. You know, when we have a wife to share the experience with, when we have children who can be our slaves, I jokingly said. <laughs> when we have uh, just that, that purpose. And then obviously when God is with us, and, he, and, and whether you're married, not married, family, not family, but you got God guiding the way and God pouring out his daily benefits upon you, it makes it a little bit easier to go through the suffering of life. And so, uh, so these are some thoughts about that, and it has to do with the, the family. And then this morning or this afternoon in Kansas City, I preached on the family and uh, the, the, the family and the church, okay? So why it's important, for instance, to take the, your family to church and make sure they're going to church and raise them in church and all that. And I mentioned that tonight's message would be a good follow-up of that. Of course, most in here probably didn't watch that, and most there probably won't be watching this right now. But if you could put the two together, and maybe some will go back and watch that, or they'll watch this one. And uh, I believe this would be a big help, because what I want to talk about tonight is investment in family. And obviously, making sure your family goes to church is an investment. But sometimes that's easier said than done. People are in different situations. Uh, you know, people, some people got married before they were saved, or maybe they got married and, and one uh, part of the family isn't as uh, serious about going to church or desiring to go to church as others. And, and, you know, that brings up a whole other situation, you know, that's not so, it's, e- you know, I talked about this on the way back. It's easy for me to say, hey, we're going to church. My family doesn't know any different. They've all grown up in church. My wife grew up in church. I grew up most of my life in church. We understand we have to go to church. Not everybody is it so easy for that. And so maybe what I can do to provide uh, help in somebody who's saying, how do I get to that point? Well, maybe this is the first step, which would be investing in family. I don't know... uh, if anyone's ever done any investing of any sort, um, I remember for a while, <clears throat> you certainly wouldn't know by looking at my uh, my bank account, <laughs> but uh, for a while I was watching uh, 
Dave Ramsey. You ever heard of him? On the he comes on talk radio and tells people how to get out of debt and how to invest and everything. And he had this principle that was, you know, I think ten or maybe fifteen percent. You know, after you get out of debt, you take like ten or fifteen percent of your income and they put that right into like a mutual fund, something that builds uh, interest. You know, it's an investment. And, you know, not all investments are something like that in the bank, right? Uh, But another thing you can invest in is a house. Believe it or not, a house, for the most part, you can pretty much, depending on if something bad happens in the neighborhood or something like that, pretty much if you buy a house, you know, you can end up selling that back and get at least the majority of the money. And depending on how you work it, you might be able to get more money back than what you bought the house for. So it's an investment. You know, maybe somebody will invest in a business. They'll say, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll invest X amount of money to get my materials. You know, I remember when I started a cleaning business, there was a little bit of overhead. You had to buy the vacuums and the cleaning supplies and you had to get certain things. You know, maybe you had to buy some some insurance for your business and all that stuff. But it was an investment that theoretically would pay off relatively quickly, you'd pay all that off and then you'd be making more money. So it was an investment, okay? And so many things in life we wanna invest in. Uh, We wanna invest in things that are going to last, of course, invest in things that are going to be beneficial down the road. And family is the probably most important asset that we have, okay? You could lose every, I've heard some people say your health, right? Your health is your wealth, you could lose you know, everything. And as long as you have your health, you might be able to rebuild it again. You might be able to go, uh, you know, uh, but if you lose your family, you know, man, that's, that's a hard one to, you know, to come back from. You could have everything. And if you don't have your family to share it with, that could be uh, problematic. And, uh, and so your family, obviously, if you have wife, kids, whatever, you're going to want to invest in that. And that's what the message is about. Okay. So first of all, the family is going to, uh, this is still introduction, but the family is going to be a blessing to you if it's done properly. I don't know if that, if, if, if I come, came out quite right. Okay. Now I could say, I could just make a blanket statement and say, you know what? Having a family is a blessing. But you think everybody in this world thinks that to be the case? <laughs> Some people's family is not so much of a blessing to them. And they have a hard time, you know, like like trying to, to have that family uh, connection that they need. or or And, and you know, so, so different people, you know, that's not so easy. But the truth is, according to the Bible, the family is a blessing. But certain investments are going to have to be made in order for that family to be a blessing. And it's not easy and it's more difficult for different people for different reasons, depending on where you are in your life or how you came about getting your family. And look, the Bible is full of illustrations. I mean, you can just go through one after another and look at the life and the examples of different families in the Bible. And you'll see not always easy. And a lot of people in the Bible, almost pretty much everybody makes mistakes when it comes to their family. But then we also see a lot of uh, glimmering hope that, hey, your family is a great blessing. And, 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 and uh, the Bible says a lot about that. Let's look at a few verses. I think last week I, I uh, mentioned some of these, but let's think about this, this again. The Bible says if a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. All the, all the wives nudge their husbands when I say that. You're supposed to say Amen. Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs chapter 5, look at verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. You say, well, what's that got to do with family? Well, if you get the picture of what he's saying, hey, he's saying, stick with your own, what God gave you, your own cisterns, your own waters. Okay, and here's what it says. Let thy fountains be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished, ravished always with her love. Now that might seem a little personal and a little bit private, 
But here's the point that he's making. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with the strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? When, when men or women, you know, they go after somebody else who's not in the marriage relationship, man, it messes everything up. And the question always comes to play, like, what's going on? Why, why would they seek, you know, some uh, uh, other, you know, some other means of affection when they should have that healthy affection at home? Okay, but and there are lots of reasons, lots of things come up for that. Uh, Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, look at verse 24. It says, uh, nope, that's not it. I'm not there yet. Proverbs 18, sorry. Proverbs 18, 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And obtaineth favor of the Lord. I gave you another chance, man. Ecclesiastes, I'm just kidding. Ecclesiastes 9. Ecclesiastes 9. And verse 9. Live joyfully. With the wife whom thou lovest all the days of, thy, of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou taketh under the sun. So God is telling the men, hey, enjoy your wife while you've got her. You know, that's your portion in this life. As you go through the journey of this life, enjoy your wife. It's a blessing from God. You know, it's not something that you're necessarily, and I won't get into this, this always makes people upset, but we won't necessarily have that relationship in the resurrection. We won't necessarily have that relationship for all eternity uh, because our focus and our affection will be f uh, solely on the Lord, but we do have that while we're on this earth. So enjoy it and, uh, and enjoy one another, okay? So... The blessings of a wife, and then we have obviously the blessings of a children. We've looked at this before, Psalm 127. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. And then Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is a man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, they shall, uh, uh, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, you could probably picture in your mind people who have a lot of kids and they're out going out of their mind because they can't handle their kids. <laughs> their, can't, their kids are, are problematic or they're just creating a lot of stress on their life or, or something like that. But I'm telling you, in a perfect situation, if we do things the way God wants us to and if we invested properly in our children, they're a blessing. They're a blessing. And we're not ashamed. And we sit there in the gates, you know, uh, as it's talking about, uh, uh, in, in we are, uh, they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot that can be said about that. Obviously, not everyone who has a family is necessarily happy with the way things are going at the moment. But I believe that we can, we can be it, uh, happy with with the the rewards that come through having a family if we will make the right investments. Okay, so I'm gonna give you three tips here. This is just practical information. You notice we're going to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and all. This is a lot of just random, just practical information that's given to us. Uh, 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 tips, if you will. But I want to use the idea of investments. And again, I'm not an investor. I don't, I don't, I haven't really invested in much of anything. Don't have stocks and bonds and all that. So, uh, so I'm speaking a little bit of a foreign language, but, but here's the idea of investments. These are some principles that maybe you've heard of and they make a lot of sense. The first one is this, invest early, invest early. 
Okay, I'll make the spiritual application in a moment. But I remember one time sitting, first time I ever heard this, since I've heard it lots of times, and I've told my kids this as well, but, but I remember the first time I heard this principle, I went to a meeting. You've probably heard of the uh, pyramid scheme type things, and they offer you like, hey, we're going to give you this gift, and we're going to provide you with this dinner if you'll just come and listen to our presentation. No strings attached. That's what they always say. All you got to do is come and listen, and you'll, you'll be rewarded for listening. And uh, I remember one of these uh, things was uh, uh, schemes, if you will, was a, a Primerica. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It was basically they sold insurance, but they tried to use that insurance as a way of investing. And if you invest so much, you know, at the end of so many years, you'll, you'll be a millionaire, <laughs> you know. And uh, whatever, I don't care. I don't know much about Primerica or yay or nay. All I know is that we sat through the whole thing. And we did get our uh, uh, prize, although we never used it because it was like you had to spend it online or something like that. But I remember the guilt trip they put us on. And they're like, so you're saying you're not interested in buying this? I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. They're saying, so basically you just came for the free gift. Yep. <laughs> that's what you told me to do. I just came and I listened and I want my free gift. And they acted like we were just terrible people for that because they didn't get their commission, you know, by us buying something. And I'm like, hey, if you're going to advertise, just come and get a free gift. You don't even have to buy anything. Well, then why in the world do you, would you be surprised that people would come and do that? Of course, they're not surprised. They know that that's what <laughs> almost everybody's there for, but they're very good high pressure salesmen. But anyway, here's the, the principle that they use. And since then, I've heard this in lots of different uh, applications. If I, as a 43 year old man, begin investing now, right? By the time I uh, retire, you know, should I ever retire, you know, I will have a chunk of money in the bank. Let's say, I don't know, I'm not even going to throw out numbers because I'll mess it up and I'm really bad at math, but a certain percentage of my investments, every month I put into that investment it grows interest, okay? Now you've got that interest plus I'm continuing to put into that and so I'm putting into a bigger amount each time the interest grows. It's called compound interest and, and it really works. It really, like if you could just keep putting into that and it, keep, it keeps growing interest, eventually you've got a lot of money in the bank, okay? But even at 43, if I started now, the amount of money that I will have after uh, however much time is, is just very, very minor compared to had I started at 18. You know, if I had started at 18 investing in such, you know, uh, you know mutual funds or whatever it is that, um, that I'm investing in, I could quite possibly already be a millionaire had I started at 18. And so, and then, and then it's, it, will, it will blow your mind to look at the numbers, but now let's say I'd be, I'd have a million dollars in the bank had I started investing whenever I was 18. If I would have started when I was 16, it'd be more like 2 million or 3 million. I mean, it'd blow your mind whenever you see those numbers because how compound interest works. Okay, so the idea is the earlier, the better. And of course, they're pushing you to make that decision because they're like, oh, I got to do it now. I'm losing money. I'm losing. You know, I got to hurry up and I got to do it. But I'm going to tell you, it's true. Like, I don't care if you invest your money, but if you're going to invest in anything that you want, you got to invest early. If you want if you get a brand new car and you want your car to last you don't wait until, you know, 10 years from now and be like, you know what? I better start taking care of my car. No, it's too late. You know what I mean? You can maybe fix it and spend a whole lot of money getting it fixed up, but you need to invest early. As soon as you get it, hey, I'm going to take care of that thing. That was maybe a bad example, okay? But this is the idea. The earlier you start, the better. Now, I know people, many people who are in uh, marriage relationships, they're later on in their life, you know, they made a lot of mistakes. Maybe they weren't even saved at the time. And now they're saved and they they're, have a zeal for the Lord and they're ready to do. But they've got all those years where certain uh, uh, key elements in their relationship has been neglected. It's not to say that they can't still have a great marriage, great family. But had they started earlier, it would have it would have had a lot uh, more uh, you know, chance of being a, a wonderful thing.
Have had I okay, let me give you the first tip. How about your spouse? How early do you start in investing in your spouse? I'll tell you this, you invest in a spouse before you ever marry somebody. <laughs> Before you ever marry them, you say, well, I've got to make sure I'm putting my investment in the right place. First of all, right? You got to search that. Let's say you're going to invest in a mutual fund. It would be wise to do your homework and find out which mutual fund is going to offer me the most interest, which one's going to be the best, has the best track record, you know, over a 30 year track record or something. It's, it, you know, I can I trust that I'm putting my investment in a good place before you even get married. You have got to do your homework. And I'm going to tell you this, the number one, without a doubt, the number, re the number one reason I believe I have a happy marriage and a happy family and things are going well is because I married the right woman. <laughs> All right. Now, some people don't have the option uh, uh, of going out and seeking that. Maybe they got themselves into a situation, you know, uh, you know, things happen in, in, in life. We make mis mistakes. I hope you know where I'm going with that. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, it wasn't the, the perfect situation, but hey, now I'm committed. You know, now I've got to follow through. This has got to be good. It's going to be a lot difficult. It doesn't mean your relationship, your marriage can't be good. Things can't go well for you. But it, it means like you, you, it would have been nicer had you invested earlier on, you know. It had been nicer had a person decided, you know what, as a kid, you know, they decided, you know, one day I'm going to have a wife. You know what? I'm going to keep myself pure for her. Wow. They don't understand the investment, how huge of an investment that would have been when they get married. And they're like, wow, this is I've been we've been pure. This is a wonderful thing. Now we can enjoy what's ours. You know, but have they go have gone into a marriage having you know already given themselves to multiple other people? It's it's not the best situation, and so it's going to be harder now to go on and have that blessed relationship uh, that God intended for them to have. And maybe you say, "Well, I've never been with anybody," but I'm going to tell you this: uh, men, particularly pornography, it will mess you up. Okay, because those are things and thoughts and images. I love how Job said, why, you know, uh, I made a covenant with my eyes not to put any, anything uh, uh, before my eyes. I can't remember how he said it. And then remember, he says, like, why would I look upon a maid? You know, and he's saying, I want to keep myself pure. I to keep my eyes pure because men at a young age, they get interested. Their body does certain things and they start getting a curiosity. And if they're not careful, they're going to spoil it. For something that doesn't mean they can't still have a happy marriage one day, but they're going to spoil what could have been much better. And uh, and again, we're trying to talk about a perfect world. <laughs> Just give me a few minutes, and I'm going to show you. We don't all we understand. We don't all live in a perfect world. In a perfect world, though, you would make that right investment. You wouldn't make the mistakes. You would everything would just go smooth, and you would have a uh, a perfect uh, relationship there. How about Disciplining our children. You know that disciplining our children is an investment. And the earlier you make that investment, the better. The earlier, the better. You say, well, how early? Don't, th don't send me to jail, but uh, Viviana's already been disciplined. <laughs> she's okay. She still smiles. She's not got any bruises or misline, you know, but... <clears throat> I won't even give you the detail. You can talk to Valerie about how, how she's been disciplined, okay? But the thing is, at her age now, she's not going to remember anything. You know, 10 years from now, she's not going to remember the things that happened to her at this age. So this is the time where we have to teach her. This might sound cruel. I hope everybody understands the principles of, of training children, right? But we need to teach her, hey, mommy and daddy are in charge. And I'm going to tell you, if we make that investment early and she learns that lesson early, and I believe my other children did pretty good on that, wow, what a wonderful life you have when your children know. All you have to do is give them that look like, you really want to disobey me? And they're like, nope, I don't want to disobey you. Whoosh, wonderful, wonderful. They just obeyed me. Now, I don't know what they're going to say about us when they leave the house. So I'm hoping that they still have a good relationship with us. <laughs> but right now, it was great. Why? We invested early. And so we've all, we're already reaping the, uh, the rewards in that. A lot of people, a lot, a lot, a lot of people don't invest early. They wait to, in fact, there are some people that say, 
you know, man, if you would even discipline your child before they're like three or something like that, you know, uh, that's just cruel and that's not, you know, they don't know any different and all that stuff. I'm going to tell you, you try, you wait till a, per, uh, a child is three years old to start disciplining them. You're in for it. <laughs> they're going to be disciplining you. <laughs> it's difficult. It's not impossible. And the investment can still be made, but it's a little bit too late. I mean, it's a, it, it would have been better had you had you started earlier. And so the earlier, the better is what I'm trying to say. Don't wait to do these things. Look at Proverbs 22. It used to be I, I felt like I was getting to where I couldn't preach these types of messages anymore. But now that we have another baby, I feel like God gave me the opportunity to say, OK, you got to practice what you preach. <laughs> you know, if you're going to preach this to other people, you have to lead by example, which is one of the qualifications of a pastor anyway. So Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. What's chasten? What's chastening with a rod? Well, it's not, you know, dislocating your child's back or something like that. But, you know, God gave children a perfect place, you know, to take that rod and go smack, smack, smack. And they get the message. OK, but the Bible actually says if you spare the rod, that's an actually demonstration of hating your child. Now, people that don't spank their kids would never say that they hate their child. But you have to understand what he's saying. He's saying if you love them, you don't want them to make mistakes. You don't want them to be bad. You know, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod uh, will, will drive it far from him. I might have messed that up. And so uh, that's really close. And, uh, and so this is what the Bible teaches over and over. And I use this when I'm out soul winning all the time to show people because, you know, you don't want to give this idea that, hey, I'm just saying, hey, say this prayer and then everything in your life is going to go great. You know, that's not how it goes. The thing is, you know, you have to receive Jesus Christ and become a child of God. But you should understand that when I'm a child of God, God's going to chasten me. And I can't just go live however I want and not suffer the, the chastening hand of God. And so I often use as an illustration, if my children go out into the road, if they run out into the road, I'm going to grab them and I'm going to spank them and make them remember not to go do that. You know, because I would much rather them get a spanking from me than to go get hit by a car and, and killed or something like that because I love them. And so if we have that mentality and we understand, we, it's not like we actually f really think that we hate our children. But if we if we have the under, understanding that, hey, I love them and I don't want them to do, but, you know, have bad things happen or for them to disobey and all that, then we will actually implement chastening. But we've got to start early, as early as we can. Another idea, uh, when people get married or they begin a family, I would say make memories early on. You know, there's a place, I meant to go find this and I forgot, but there's a place in the Old Testament law where it actually says when, when a man uh, gets married, he gets a new wife. If he's a soldier, he doesn't, go to, he doesn't go to war for that year. It sounds like maybe he got the year off to spend that time with his wife. And I'm thinking, well, that would be a great idea. Usually not practical or possible uh, in this current time, but I mean, in, the, in, in our culture, but if you could spend an entire year to get to know one another and go do all the traveling and, the, and enjoying yourself, if you had a little bit of money set aside or whatever, where you could do that, uh, what a great time to remember. This is why people like to go straight after they're marriage, uh, married. They go on a honeymoon or something where they can enjoy each other and they can enjoy that time and make some memories. Children, when they're young, obviously they have to, you know, they get to a certain age where they can start remembering things. Too early, this wouldn't really work for that. But uh, when they're young, there's memories that are being made. You know, and you don't have to, you don't, I think everybody understands this. It's hard sometimes to remember as parents, but but, you know, you don't have to make expensive investments in your children's in, 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 in giving your children memories. Does that make sense? Think about children. 
Everybody uses the illustration, Christmas time, you buy them this real expensive toy, and the rest of the day they're playing with the box. <laughs> and you're like, wait, that box didn't cost anything. You better play with this expensive toy that I bought you, right? But they're remembering, hey, that was fun. We made this airplane out of, out of the box, and we pushed each other around or whatever. Memories don't have to be expensive, but children are remembering. They're remembering the time you spend with them, how you love them, how you take them places. I remember my mom uh, bought us uh, tickets a, a long, uh, uh, several years ago, we bought us tickets to Disneyland or Disney World, whatever it is in Florida. And, uh, and you know, I appreciate that. It was great. We loved it. She bought our tickets. She bought all that. Uh, uh, and and we, we did have a great time. But it's funny, our trip was really, uh, you know, there was a lot that we had to do in just a little bit of time. And of all the things that we did, I honestly think that the one that, that we remember the least and the children remember the least was going to Disney World. It's just I, we don't, I have some memories of it. I think my children, they, they might talk about one or two things that they, that they did whenever we were there. But, you know, they remember more some of the other things we did. And I think that the, the most vivid memory, what they enjoyed the most was when we went to the beach. We're like, you know, we're not that far from the beach and the kids have never seen the beach before. And so we drove down to the beach. They got to play in the sand. They got to see the ocean. And uh, and yeah, it was a, it, that was a great memory. So sometimes what we think we need to do to make children have, you know, enjoy themselves and to say, hey, mom and dad love me. No, they just need your time and your investment. And you say, hey, I care about you and I want to do something fun with you. And that creates memories. We got to do it early. I spent a lot of time on that first point, but I want to uh, go ahead and move on to the second point, which is this. Invest what you can afford to invest. I mean, can you imagine if somebody said, oh, this principle of investing and, hey, I want to be a millionaire someday. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to invest 90 percent of my income. <laughs> Well, good luck living off 10%. That's probably not going to last very long before you're like, you know, I can't do it. <laughs> you know, you got to think realistically, you got to count the cost and you got to invest what you're able to invest in. So here's what I mean. If you have to work a job, if you have to work two jobs to be able to pay, you know, for the expenses of having a family and everything, you have to understand some of my time making those memories, some of that time spending with my wife, some of that time, I'm not going to actually have that. I only can give what I can possibly give, and that's okay. Don't feel like I got to do more. I got to do more. Invest what you can. Invest as early as you can and, and do what you can to, uh, to help. Uh, we talked about disciplining children. You know, what some people will do is, is man, I got to make sure my children are perfect. And so I need to discipline them and they discipline them and discipline and over discipline them. And they're too harsh on them and they're too strict. And I'm going to tell you that usually doesn't end up well for the kids. Right. Because it makes them bitter and it makes them upset. Look at Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six, verse four. This is right after it says to the children to honor thy father and thy mother. And then in verse four, it says, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you're bringing them up. You're obviously disciplining them. You're obviously doing, you know, what, what you can do, but you're not just getting onto them to the point where you're provoking them unto wrath and they're bitter and they don't like their mom and dad because their mom and dad is too, you know, you got to be careful. Now that doesn't mean be your best, your, your kid's best friends either. You've got to lay down the law, but you don't want to invest more than you can afford to invest. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. So don't, uh, uh, first of all, invest early. Second of all, invest what you can afford to invest. Uh, if you notice again, every family in the Bible, no, I mean, no families are perfect. We understand. I, I, okay. Let me just spend more time. I don't want to just fly past this. Very important that we realize all this talk about a perfect world, all this talk about invest what you can invest, invest as early as you can. Some people could get discouraged and be like, you know, why isn't my family perfect? Why isn't look at no family is perfect. If you look on Facebook and you see the perfect family, it's probably not true, okay? And I do everything I can to make people see the best of our family. And occasionally, I'll let them see a few uh, not so pleasant things, but I try to let them see the best of our family. That's natural, okay? We all want to do that. 
But let's be honest, that doesn't mean my family never has any bad things happen or we never have, you know, arguments or that the kids don't fight or that, you know, there's a little bit of a hesitation to obey mom or dad or look, we all have problems. There is no family that's perfect. So you don't go into this whole investing thing thinking that you live in a perfect world where it's just going to all work out. That's going, you're going to get discouraged when you find out that no family is perfect. And in fact, I think the Bible makes that abundantly clear by, like I said earlier, including so many examples, giving us so many examples of families that are dysfunctional. <laughs> I mean, it starts with Adam and Eve, Right. They have problems, but hey, you give them a little bit of liberty. They're the first people that ever were tempted, you know, to sin. They're children, right? The older brother kills the younger brother. That's not cool. <laughs> you follow the story around, you get to Noah. You're like, all right, God's going to start all over again. He has, a, he has this family. He has Noah. And you see they get off the ark and immediately you see some weird stuff going on. I don't even know exactly what happens with Ham. And uh, he's looking on his father's nakedness and, and he's doing some weird stuff. You got Noah getting drunk. You got who knows what all happened right there. But you see uh, not the perfect family. It comes to Abraham and you see Abraham is, uh, is lying about his wife and he's like willing to like basically let the Egyptians take his wife so that he's not killed. And you're thinking, well, Abraham, this is our hero. But God allowed you to see the truth. And, see some, and there's other things that happen in Abraham's life as well that show you that his family wasn't perfect. Jacob's family certainly wasn't perfect. You're talking about the 12 brothers and they wanted to sell and they sold their Joseph into Egypt and wanted to kill him. And they're all fighting amongst each other because after all, their dad had four women by which he had all these 12 kids. And so, uh, and so that's going to cause tension and problems in the family. Look, one after another, David, you've seen David's uh, track record with women? Not so good, okay? And his children, how about Rehoboam? How about Absalom? You know, he did not have the greatest track record with his family. So God gives us over and over all these examples, and it's like it's reminding you, no family is perfect. You can try to live for the Lord. You're going to mess up. You're going to fall in some places. But you know what? Keep trying. Keep investing what you can. Keep doing what you can when you can do it. And, uh, and the Lord understands that and is going to help you. And, uh, and, and you are going to at least make your life with your family the best that you can. All right? And the final thing is this. Allow your investments to mature. Allow your investments to, ma to mature. And here's what I mean by that. If I did invest in stocks and bonds, which I've never done that, don't plan on, I guess, is 401k considered stocks and bonds? I don't know. It's more of a mutual fund or something. Uh, there was one place I worked where I did 401k for a long time. But anyway, I've never played the stock market. I've never watched. Hey, is NASDAQ up? I don't even know what NASDAQ is. <laughs> is uh, you know, how is, how is the oil doing? I don't care about the price of oil. Right? I just put gas in the car and... and you know, if it gets too expensive, we only get half a tank. <laughs> so I don't really think about these investments and watch all these kinds of things. OK, but here's what I know. If I put money, I talked about track record a couple times. Here's what I mean by that. If I put money in a mutual fund, here's what it means. A mutual fund. Lots of people invest in this and you're kind of sharing in this investment and you're, you're choosing a mutual fund, or rather the bank or whoever you're dealing with, chose this mutual fund. And here's how they chose it. They said, hey, we watched all of these companies over 30 years period of time. And over 30 years of time, they all came out ahead. Okay. But what that doesn't show you is that just because they were here and after 30 years they were here, that doesn't mean it didn't look like this. You know what I mean? Because if you follow the track record, there's going to be some times where if you were watching every day your, the stock markets and you're looking at where your money is and you say, whoa, it's down so much percent. Ah, get out of there. I don't want to lose more money. But you can't do that if you're investing. And I'm not encouraging everyone to invest. I'm just saying when it comes to investment, you can't do that. You have to be in it for the long term and say, you know what, eventually it's going to come back up. Because every so often our society has a pandemic 
Every so often, our society has some kind of a crash uh, or some kind of a, a raise of the price of oil or something like that, and a lot of things go down. But if you follow that track record, eventually it goes back up. Well, you know what? When we invest in our family, we have got to be in it for the long haul. And we've got to say, you know what? I'm making all these investments, and I'm not going to flip out every time I don't see the return on my investments. I'm going to wait. I'm going to let it mature. I'm going to watch. I'm going to let it grow slowly. I believe in the in the investment world, uh, slow growth is 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 what you're looking for. You don't want this really fast thing because it's probably going to go down just as fast as it went up. Okay, and think about this: your 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 a weed. Okay, a weed. Think about how fast a weed sprouts up in your garden, right? But there's no substance there. I mean, you can pull that thing out real easily, right? But a tree. You know, it's got those roots growing down. It takes a while to grow up, but once it gets growing, that thing is strong and solid and it's not going anywhere. That's how you got to view investing in your family. This is in the long haul. Okay, I started early. Things might have got rocky from here, you know, from time to time, but I'm looking at the long haul. I want, I want to make sure this investment goes uh, to completion. I skipped a few verses, but we're out of time, so I'm just going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to reiterate there, Proverbs 22, um, that we read earlier, it said, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, that's the way we should be looking at, uh, toward, you know, when we're investing in our, to raise our children, for instance, you know, hey, I want to keep making sure they go that direction that they're supposed to go in. Sometimes they get off the path, I need to redirect them, and eventually they get it. Eventually... They're going the right way is the is the goal, all right? But we need to invest. We need to invest. We need to pray for them. We need to do uh, what we need to discipline them, correct them. We need to give to them, help teach them. All these things take a lot of work, but we're investing in them. And in the end, this is going to be our benefit. You say, well, that's, self, that's selfish. That's self-centered. Well, all I'm saying is that all those verses I read in Proverbs were like, hey, this is your reward. Enjoy the fruit of your labor. Enjoy <laughs> these things that God gave you under the sun. It's okay to enjoy it. And it's okay to be a little selfish and say, you, you know what? I'm correcting my kids because I want my kids to be a blessing to me. <laughs> now, ultimately, I want them to serve the Lord and love the Lord. But while they're in my house, things sure go nice whenever, they're, whenever they know who's in charge you know, and things sure go well with my wife, who's my help, you know, who, who does so much for me when, that I can't do at the house or whatever. And things go so much better when I'm investing in her, you know, about time we go on another date, you know, I would think <laughs> she's in agreement with <laughs> because the more that I invest in her, the happier I'm. And one of these days, the kids are going to be out of the house and I'm still going to have her around. So, so I got to be investing in her on a daily basis. OK, I need to be picking more flowers. It's about that time for them to start growing on the trail. I don't buy flowers. I pick them. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for our families and uh, and the families that we were allowed to uh, we were able to grow up in. Lord, our, our parents and and siblings and, and certainly every single one of us can look at our family life and. And uh, whether it's the one that we grew up in or the one that we were part of on our own, our own family, uh, and we could say it certainly wasn't perfect. There were certainly ups and downs. Some in here, no doubt, had worse situations than others. Uh, but, Lord, I pray for those who are starting families or have, they have families right now and uh, they're raising children and they're, and they're uh, trying to figure out marriage and and all that, and I pray that you'll help us to uh, to make the proper investment and to make it as early as we can. That we would invest what we're able to and give what we can, and and that we would allow that investment to mature and to grow over time. Looking unto you primarily, Lord, for for help with these things, and Lord, as uh, things go well in our family. Uh, and, and things are working the way they should, and they're a blessing, Lord. Help us use uh, all those benefits that you've given us, Lord, to give back to you and to put into your work and to glorify you for all that you've done for us. I pray that you'll help us as a church, both here and in Kansas City, Lord, as we uh, invest in our families, that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.